On March 11, 2011, the Tohoku earthquake in Japan caused a series of events that led to a major nuclear accident. In the aftermath of the meltdown and explosions, hundreds of thousands were evacuated. The plant site remains uninhabitable. In this video, we'll explore the events leading to the Fukushima disaster, what went wrong, and current prevention measures. After the Second World War, Japan experienced an economic miracle. Despite the devastating loss in lives and infrastructure, the Japanese economy and population saw unprecedented growth over the next 20 years. With this growth came an increasing demand for power and electricity. In 1955, with intervention from the United States, Japan passed the Atomic Energy Basic Law, marking the beginning of its era of nuclear energy. The Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant is in Okuma, a small coastal town. It was built in the 60s as part of Japan's nuclear energy development. It has six reactors and a total capacity of 4.7 GR, making it the second most powerful nuclear facility in Japan, after Kashiwazaki Kariwa. The plant powers Miyagi, Takiki, Ibaraki, and Tokyo. Japan is seismically active due to its location at the convergence of four tectonic plates, making it prone to earthquakes and tsunamis. The country has strict earthquake building standards. When Fukushima Daiichi was built, TEPCO ensured it met safety standards. The plant is on a 35-meter high hill. The plant's vital reactors were made earthquake resistant by flattening a small hill, reducing its height to 25 meters. The structure's foundations were built on solid bedrock, not loose soil and gravel-free. TEPCO believed the site was safe from tsunamis due to a 6-meter seawall built for protection for. Just days before the earthquake, TEPCO submitted a report to Japan's Nuclear Safety Agency. The report detailed the vulnerability of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant to a similar earthquake that occurred in 1896. It stated that a 7.2 magnitude earthquake could generate tsunamis twice the height of the plant seawall. If this were to happen, the consequences could be serious. In a terrible twist of fate, disaster struck just four days later on March 11, 2011. At 2.46 p.m., an earthquake with a magnitude of 9.1 occurred off the eastern coast of Japan. The 2011 Tohoku earthquake is considered the strongest and most destructive in Japan's history. It is also the sixth largest earthquake globally. Waves up to 40 meters high were reported in northern Japan. These massive waves would have been as tall as a 12-story building. The tsunami traveled at 700 kilometers slash edge and reached 10 kilometers inland in some areas. Within hours of the earthquake, over 1 million buildings were destroyed or damaged. Relief efforts were hindered by low temperatures and snowfall, making it difficult to travel. 20,000 people lost their lives and 450,000 were displaced with their homes destroyed or submerged. But for the people living near the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, the worst was yet to come. 2.46 p.m. Just seconds after the initial shockwaves, reactors 1, 2, and 3 at Fukushima Daiichi were automatically shut down. Reactors 4, 5, and 6 were undergoing maintenance and not operational. Fortunately, the fuel rods in Reactor 4 had already been removed and placed in a spent fuel pool. This pool, used by nuclear power plants, stores spent fuel rods. It contains boron to keep the rods cool and prevent nuclear reactions. However, this spent fuel pool later proved to be a serious problem. The tremors cut off the power plant from the grid. Safety precautions were in place for this situation. Backup generators kicked in to cool the reactors with circulating water. Without coolant, reactors are at risk of a nuclear meltdown. Just six minutes later, Reactor 1's emergency cooling system was activated. It detected increased pressure inside the reactor vessel. This system automatically opens a safety relief valve to vent out hot steam. It prevents dangerous pressure buildups that could cause a catastrophic explosion, 3.27 p.m. The first tsunami strikes the facility's seawall. The first wave was absorbed by the seawall, protecting the power plant. But a few minutes later, the emergency condenser for Reactor 1 fails. Without this system, the temperature of the steam inside Reactor 1 continues to increase to dangerous levels. 3.46 p.m. 
A 14-meter tsunami, more than double the height of the facility's seawall, strikes the power plant. As reported by Tepsio four days ago, the tsunami floods the entire plant, submerging all but one of the backup diesel generators, rendering them inoperable. The facility lost power, causing all safety systems to shut down. Unfortunately, most emergency core cooling systems were not working. Temperatures rose inside the reactors as employees rushed to resolve the crisis. If they fail to restore power to the reactors, a meltdown will be inevitable. 6 o'clock p.m. water levels inside Reactor 1 have fallen critically low, exposing the top of the fuel rods. Without enough water for cooling, the reactor's temperature increases. An hour later, Japanese Prime Minister Naokan declares a nuclear emergency after learning about Fukushima Daiichi's status. Government officials reassure the public that the declaration was a precaution, no radiation detected, proper procedures underway. 30 minutes later, Reactor 1's fuel fully exposed to air. Without water, fuel rods heat up and eventually melt. Nuclear meltdown had begun, 9 o'clock p.m. A mandatory evacuation order is issued by the government to people within a 3-kilometer radius of the plant due to fears of a catastrophic explosion like Chernobyl. Those within 10 kilometers were advised to prepare for evacuation. The next day, 5.30 a.m., Officials decided to vent steam from Reactor 1 to release small amounts of radiation. This was a critical decision due to the risk of an accidental explosion if hydrogen ignited upon contact with oxygen. Luckily, 20 minutes later, emergency power was restored. Workers pumped fresh water into Reactor 1 to cool it down. But one hour later, unbeknownst to the workers, the fuel rods inside Reactor 1 melted completely. The steam reacts with the fuel, creating excess hydrogen gas in the core. 3.30 p.m., the mandatory evacuation radius is extended to all people within 10 kilometers of Fukushima Daiichi. Just six minutes later, a massive hydrogen explosion rocks the building of Reactor 1, destroying the containment vessel but leaving the reactor core intact. Five plant workers were injured in the explosion. Later during the day, the mandatory evacuation zone had been extended to 20 kilometers on March 13 at 2.42 am. The coolant injection system for Reactor 3 fails. The water level in the reactor decreases as it boils away from excess heat. Later during the day, the explosion at Unit 1 of Fukushima Daiichi was declared a Level 4 International Nuclear and Radiological Event, an accident with local consequences. By 7 a.m., the fuel rods inside Reactor 3 are now directly exposed to the air as water levels continue to drop. Two hours later, the fuel rods melt due to extreme temperatures. Another reactor core is dangerously close to exploding. March 14, 11 1 a.m. Another explosion occurred in Reactor 3 due to pressure and hydrogen gas buildup, causing the Reactor 3 building to collapse. 11 workers were injured and water pipes for Reactor 2 were damaged. TPCO announces no release of radioactive material from two explosions. 1.15 p.m. Reactor 2's cooling system fails, causing water levels to decrease. By 8 p.m., fuel rods in Reactor 2 are fully exposed. A third meltdown is now inevitable. By 6 a.m. the next day, a third explosion damages an area above the reactor and the spent fuel pool of Reactor 4. A fire breaks out, releasing dangerous radiation. Seawater is pumped into Units 1, 2, and 3 to stabilize core temperatures. On March 17, the Japanese Self-Defense Force used helicopters to dump seawater onto Unit 3 in a desperate attempt to salvage the situation. It's worth noting that TPCO and government officials were trying to contain the situation at Fukushima Daiichi. Meanwhile, the rest of Japan was still dealing with the aftermath of the earthquake and tsunami. Vital infrastructure like roads and bridges were destroyed, which slowed down rescue and relief operations. Finally, on March 20, replacement diesel generators were brought to Rectors 5 and 6. By the next day, they were finally brought to a cold shutdown. On the same day, power was restored for the first time in Reactors 1 and 2. However, despite these positive developments, the damage had already been done to the surrounding land and waters. The incident released radioactive material like iodine-131, caesium-134, and caesium-137 into the atmosphere. 
TPCO revealed in 2013 that contaminated groundwater leaked into the Pacific Ocean. Some tap water and agricultural products had traces of radioactive material. A 2013 WHO report found that people in Fukushima Prefecture had a higher risk of thyroid cancer compared to those in other areas. Over 200 square kilometers around Fukushima Daiichi is still a nuclear exclusion zone due to high radiation levels. Today, 12 years after the accident, work is ongoing to clean up and limit radioactive contamination in Fukushima Daiichi. The decommissioning of the plant could cost tens of billions of dollars and take another 30 or 40 years. The removal of spent nuclear fuel from the reactor cores is crucial in the Fukushima disaster cleanup. As of 2021, spent fuel from reactors 3 and 4 has been removed. Operations to remove fuel from reactors 2 and 1 will start in fall 2023 and 2027. Reactors 5 and 6 suffered no major damages and were shut down in 2011. A few months after the disaster, Tepiseo installed radioactive water treatment systems to decontaminate the water. However, the nuclear plant now has too much waste water and no space to store it. In April 2021, the Japanese government approved Tepxdo's plan to dump water into the Pacific Ocean. This decision worries experts who fear it could harm marine life and the local fishing industry. The Japanese cabinet stated that the dumped water will be diluted by the ocean. The Fukushima nuclear disaster revealed important safety lessons. These lessons are now implemented worldwide, including in Japan. One example is the installation of emergency systems that don't rely on electricity. It's an industry standard to have backup batteries for power outages. Backup diesel generator rooms must now be watertight and blast resistant. What are your thoughts on Japan's response to the Fukushima disaster? What do you think they could have done better? Let us know in the comments.